I am very excited about this next conversation. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to read Tony's book over the weekend, as I said, um, and I suggest all of you read it. Here it is. It's, it, some of you have it already. Um, Delivering Happiness. Uh, it's out there. Thanks to Tony for all of you. So um, please join me in both thanking and welcoming Tony Shea to our stage. Hey, Tony? Good. You sit right here. So, Tony, the book's doing well. Uh, we just launched yesterday, had our launch party last night, and uh, yeah, we're pretty excited so far. I, I think we don't find out till next Wednesday how where it ranks on the New York Times list, but uh, it's doing well on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. It's number one on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com, so congratulations. That's very, yeah. Um, and, and as an author who made it to seven, I'm just a little jealous. Um, <laughs> So that, that's, that's super cool. And, and, and the book, there's a lot in it. it. You know, you start really with childhood memories and you go all the way through the uh, acquisition by Amazon. I want to talk about a, a few of those things. You said that uh, writing this book was on your checklist. Um, and another story in the book you talk about in a very sort of critical juncture in Zappos' life um, when you weren't even certain whether or not you were going to make it to the next quarter, much less the next month. You went on a trip to Kilimanjaro and climbed Kilimanjaro, which was another thing on your checklist. Right. Um, when did you decide to have a checklist, and, and, and what else is on it? Um, I guess I don't really explicitly, I, I don't have an actual list. It was more just, oh, you know, like running a marathon, which was just one of those things in the back of my mind. I always thought, oh, I would like to do one day. But you know, I guess the, writing a book was something that had wasn't explicitly there, but I had always thought, oh, you know, one day would do that. But it's actually kind of evolved over the years in terms of what actually led me to write the book. Uh, originally, you know, in terms of the checklist, it was thinking about, okay, I uh, will one day run a marathon and one day write a book. So I chose marathon because that seemed like less work. And so, <laughs> um, but then. Uh, as we, we actually offer tours to the public at Zappos, and we're located in Las Vegas, so uh, next time any of you want to you know, or happen to be in Las Vegas, we'll pick you up in a Zappos shuttle, give you a tour, and then drop you off at the hotel. And um, you, you, there's actually even a website for it. Just go to tours.zappos.com. And uh, anyway, so we get, used to give these tours, and then afterwards people would have questions like, oh, what are your interview questions and how do we evaluate candidates? And we're very transparent and we're happy to share anything. So we used to take it over to our head of recruiting and she would provide the answer. Uh, as we got more and more tours coming, then we ended up launching a website called zapposinsights.com where it's a subscription service and uh, people can ask questions and we record the answers on video and make that available to everyone. And so the book was really just another way of sharing more of how we do things because I think maybe 50 years ago, businesses had to choose between uh, maximizing profits and making customers or employees happy. Whereas I think today we live actually, we're at, right at the beginning of a very special time where because we're all hyper-connected and information travels so quickly through Twitter and bl blogging and so on, that it's actually possible to have it all to make employees happy, make customers happy, uh, make vendors happy, and ultimately make uh, investors happy through driving profits. Now, well, I think you did make your investors happy um, <laughs> when the, you sold the company to Amazon. Um, but there was some tension in that. And, and you, there's an article that, that you wrote that came out in Inc., which I think was an expansion of what was in the book. Um, but one of the things that you, you wrote, um, it seemed, and, and tell me if I'm interpreting this correctly, that if you had your druthers, you wouldn't have sold Zappos necessarily. Um, I think that's what we, so you know, it was all over Twitter yesterday because of the Inc. article, but I think some of the headlines that people propagating the stories um, put were a little bit misleading. Well, I wanted to give you the to opportunity to clear, to clear that up. Um, but it led to more retweets. But I, I mean, we weren't, we certainly weren't forced to. There was no way we could have been forced to sell because I effectively controlled enough you know, of the common shares. Um, but. Yeah, I guess it's, it was one of those things where psychologically, you know, we always thought, oh, we'll be, stay independent and one day become public. And so when Amazon uh, first approached us early last year, 
kind of the visceral reaction was, no, we're not interested. But as we ended up talking more and more with them, we realized, actually, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, and ultimately, we thought about, OK, what's our vision? Our vision is about uh, essentially the title of the book, Delivering Happiness to Customers, to Employees, and spreading that idea to other companies as well. And we'll be, we'll, if we're under the Amazon umbrella, uh, but we're able to maintain our independence and uh, continue to build the Zappos brand and our culture, and our way of doing business are the way we always have, will that allow us to get to that vision faster? That's really the ultimate question. And, uh, and well, that combined with the whole control issue. So uh, this acquisition is actually very different from most acquisitions that Amazon has done. Most of them, they end up integrating and folding it into Amazon. But as a precondition, we, we actually explicitly talked about the independence part of it. And they've remained true to their word. It's been the equivalent of switching out our board of directors with a new one. And we, instead of flying to Silicon Valley once a quarter for board meetings, we fly up to Seattle once a quarter. And if it's any indication, Jeff Bezos uh, actually has yet to even visit our headquarters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder, and you, you say in the book that, that you know, your culture is, is the brand, the culture you have in the company. And, the, mm -hmm. and, and you know, you've been at Web2 and, and talked about the culture. and, and, and you're probably one of the most well-known examples of a, a happy, healthy, you know, innovative culture um, that's sprung up recently in business. Do you think that, is it your mission or part of your mission to infect Amazon with that culture? Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from each other, whether on the culture side or, uh, you know, in other areas of the business. But uh, we're not trying to change Amazon. It's and, or push anything on them and vice versa. So uh, it's really up to them what makes sense for their culture. They have their own strong culture and they uh, have their own approach as to what makes for a great customer experience. And so uh, there's actually been, but we have different philosophies as to what delivering great customer experiences mean. Uh, for them, they're more about being uh, high tech and, and so, uh, I think they publicly state it's about convenience, selection, and low prices, whereas we're really more about being high touch. And so that just leads to different uh, philosophies about culture. For our whole belief is that if we get the culture right, most of the other stuff, like delivering great hu human personalized service uh, or building a long-term enduring brand will just happen naturally on its own. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think they are much more focused on the customer first. Mm -hmm. over employees yeah. would be my guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the vision that you have and the way that you did the deal was, was quite something. And you did it not as cash, but as stock. And, and you know, you were looking, as you say, in the book. And you're very explicit about it. And while I was reading it, sort of putting on a journalistic hat, I was thinking, wow, I can't believe he's telling me this stuff you know, in the book. Because you sort of go through the whole, the tensions that the board, that boards want exits. and. That's normal. There's nothing, you know, mm -hmm. Sequoia wants an exit. Um, and you figured out a way to sort of, you know, do a little judo and get that exit done and bring in, as you say, sort of another board. It just happens to be Amazon. But at the end of the day, when, you know, when you were building this company, it's been a decade or more than a decade that you built the company. You know, part of your mission and your ambition was to out Amazon Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. So how did that, how did that change when, when Amazon became your sort of corporate parent, did, did you get the sense that there was a w any wind taken out of the sails there, or? Um, I think in, initially, just kind of the you know, visceral reaction, not just with me, but with employees. But then as everyone actually started thinking about it more, uh, you know, I talked about in the book how we, we announced it, I think, at 1 p.m. Uh, on last July. And we just basically, every manager wrote off that the rest of the day just assumed no work would get done. Right. And within an hour, it was back to business as usual. And people were excited uh, about the possibilities now that it was a uh, reality. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, whether we're under Amazon or a public company or, or not, it's uh, just a legal structure. It's really more about whether we feel like we have our own identity and our own ability to make our own decisions, and which we do. Right, right. Um, I, I want to go back to a couple of stories that are in the book and, and, let, and let you kind of tell us about them. Um, th there's one that, that struck me as almost uh, as a bit poignant, which is your first company. 
Um, and, and I think you, you say in the book you learned a lot from particularly the last year and a half or so at Link Exchange, which is mm -hmm. a company you sold for multiple hundreds of millions of dollars to, to Microsoft. Um, but you noticed that you weren't really enjoying, you were hitting the snooze button when you woke up and you sort of avoiding trying to go to work. Um, and how did that experience of, of realizing that maybe you weren't, you hadn't built a culture there that you w were eager to, to be part of in, inform what you ended up doing at, at Zappos? Yeah, well, I, I think we just didn't know any better to pay attention to culture. I, I think it was one of those, th I mean, I, it was a lot of fun when it was just five or 10 of us, kind of your .com, stereotypical dot-com back in 96, where, uh, you know, working under a desk, uh, or not working under our desk, sleeping under our desk, <laughs> working on top of our desk, and uh, he's like George um, Costanza works yeah. under his desk. And uh, <laughs> it, but we literally had no idea what day of the week it was, and it was a lot. But we hired as we hired people with the right, you know, they had the right skill sets and experiences, but weren't necessarily culture fits. And you know, there wasn't any one hire that brought the company culture downhill. It was just kind of a slow thing that happened. Uh, and yeah, just woke up one day and realized, you know, I'm kind of dreading going into the office. And uh, with Zappos, just want to make sure that I didn't make that same mistake again. A big inflection point, it seems, for, for, for Zappos, and maybe one of your um, strengths, was deciding to move the company from San Francisco to, you know, of all places, at least from, the, from an outside perspective, Las Vegas. Right. Um, why did you make that move, and how did it change your culture? Yeah, so we've been in Las Vegas for six years now, and originally the reason for moving out of the Bay Area was because when we decided we wanted to build the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service, uh, we realized we couldn't do that in the Bay Area because it's there, it's usually viewed as a temp job, no one wants to do it as a career, um, and cost of living is so high, you can't have a career, even if you wanted it as a career, you couldn't do that and own a house, for example. So we looked at a whole bunch of uh, other cities. We looked at Phoenix, Louisville, uh, someplace in Iowa, Iowa I think, uh, Oregon, and a few others. And ultimately, we decided on Las Vegas, uh, not because Las, Las Vegas actually was not the cheapest, but we thought it would make our existing employees the happiest. And we had about 90 employees at the time, and about 70 ended up moving with the company there. And I think for us, for most employees, it was more just Okay, this is think of this more as an adventure, and we'll give Vegas a try. You know, and if we don't like it, six months or a year, we can always move back. And one of the, it seems obvious in retrospect, but at the t one of the best things that happened as a result of that was we it really helped our culture because after working all day in the office we had no one else to hang out with except each other. So, we, so it kind of forced us to all really. So you, had a, you, had, you call it a tribe. You had a, a Zappos tribe that kind of got transplanted to Las Vegas. Yeah, but I mean, in San Francisco, we had a pretty good culture. But at the end of the day, everyone went home to their set of friends. And in Vegas, that wasn't because no one knew anyone else. And, and so we've ended up forming this really, really strong initial community the first six months and then as additional employees, people, it was pretty much over a six to nine month period that all the employees eventually made, made the transition and so as each new employee came each week they would kind of, you know, ask what was going on that night and, and then just be added to this and then, and so that's just kind of propagated over the years and now any new employee that joins is instantly invited to, you know, there's something going on every night, usually multiple things going on every night and uh, that, yeah, I, so it turned out to be a, one of these unanticipated things that was really, really good for our culture. Now, I want to go through some of the things that, you, that, that you're known for, and I just, I want to make, I mean, some of you may have heard some of these, but they just bear repeating. So you still offer $2,000 to any new employee to leave? At the end of the first week of training. And so especially for a call center rep where starting pay is $11 an hour, uh, and there's plenty of other call centers in Las Vegas, $2,000 is a pretty significant amount of money. So uh, the original reason for doing that is we didn't want employees that were there just for a paycheck. And uh, we really want employees that believed in our long-term vision uh, and felt like this was a culture they wanted to be a part of. And, uh, but what's funny is the biggest benefit now is actually not from employees that take the offer, but from employees that don't take the offer. Because they still have to go home 
talk to their friends and family and uh, over the weekend and think about, is this a company I really believe in and want to commit to? And when they finally decide to give up that easy $2,000, on Monday when they're back in the office, they're that much more passionate and engaged. So. And then do you have uh, new hire fraud? <laughs> like people who try to get hired so they can get the two grand? You know, we get asked that a lot and it's, it just hasn't happened. Um, I don't know. I mean, part of it is our recruiting team has. I mean, you, that's where I was going. Is you've got yeah. a really interesting approach to, to recruitment. You have sort of two sets of, of people who have to sign off on every. Right. Know, so the, we do two sets of interviews. The hiring manager and his or her team will interview for the standard, you know, fit within the team, relevant experience, technical ability, and so on. But then our HR department does a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit. And we have uh, interview questions for each and every one of our So core, uh, core give values. me a sort of a typical culture fit question. Um, well, probably the one that trips us up the most during the hiring process isn't so much a question, but um, the specific core value is be humble. Because there's a lot of really smart, talented people out there that are also really egotistical. And <laughs> we just won't hire them. Whereas at most other companies, probably the conversation would be, well, this person's, uh, you know, will probably rub you the wrong wrong way sometimes. It's kind of annoying, but he's going to add a lot of value to the company. Therefore, we should hire him. And that one hire isn't going to bring the company culture downhill. But you keep making compromises like that over and over and over again. I think that's mo why most large companies don't have great cultures. Um, so specifically for that core value, it's kind of hard to ask. You know, you, you can't say. So how, how humble, humble are you, are you on a I'm scale the most of one to ten? Ever. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> The one way we do test that is, you know, I talked about on the tours where we pick people up in shuttles. A lot of people that I interview also fly in, so we'll pick them up in a shuttle. Uh, they'll get a tour and then, uh, and then spend the day interviewing. But afterwards, our recruiting person goes back to the shuttle driver and asks how they were treated. And if they weren't treated well, then we answer that question. Yeah, very interesting. Now let's talk about marketing for a bit because I think you you. you Reading the book, it, sent, it struck me that you're a natural marketer. Um, you know that you sort of seem to have it in your genetics to to be a marketer. And you write about marketing in in the book, um, and you say that the approach you take is quite distinct. As a matter of fact, I think you sort of you even use conversational marketing, which is the name of the summit. And you say, yeah, it's about talking to customers on the phone um, and having actual conversations one on one with customers. Mm -hmm. um, Talk to me a little bit about how you use the telephone um, and how you, the metrics that you use, which are quite distinct from other call center metrics. Yeah, most call centers, uh, we run our call center pretty differently. Most call centers are focused on maximizing efficiency, which is all about how many customers can you talk to in a day, which translates into how, many, how quickly can you get a customer off the phone. Whereas uh, I think our, our longest phone call was almost six hours long. I don't think they even ended up buying What did anything. they talk about? Um, <laughs> you know, most calls actually aren't, don't end up being orders, uh, but maybe they, it's their first time going through the returns process and they need help stepping through that, or uh, maybe they want fashion advice for a wedding this weekend, or I, I think some of them call us just because they're lonely or something. <laughs> so we're happy to, happy to talk to them. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of times when I speak at marketing or uh, branding conferences, there's a lot of uh, discussion about consumers being bombarded with thousands and thousands of marketing messages every day, how to get your brand to stand out, how to get your message to stand out. And as kind of low tech and unsexy as it may sound, our belief is that the telephone is one of the best branding devices out there because you have the customer's undivided attention for five to 10 minutes. And if you get that interaction right, what we found is they it, it makes an emotional impact on them, and they remember it for a very long time, uh, and they tell their friends and family about it. And we've actually looked at, uh, you know, statistically, it also increases the number of purchases they make on the internet without calling us, and uh, the size of their purchases, and and so on. So we're huge believers in that. We put our one. That's why we put our one eight hundred. No, 1-800 number at the top of every single page of our website. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting that, you know, um, a, about a year ago when, when Bing was introduced, one of the features that got a big applause line was that they actually look for that 800 number uh, and they put it at the top of the search result. Hmm. Because it's very hard to find in most commerce-driven sites because they don't want you to call that number because they see it as costing them money. Yeah. But you see it as 
an engagement that builds your brand. Yeah, and, and really just in, instead of viewing, yeah, exactly. Instead of viewing phone calls as an expense to minimize, view it through a branding lens, and it's really a, a marketing expense or investment. It's probably the mm -hmm. way right. a better expression. Right. Um, another thing that Zappos is well known for, and, I, and I, we're at question time, so please, mics come down and, and folks raise your hand so they can, we can get the mics in the right places. Um, that, that you're well known for is what, what became the culture book. Um, can you describe what that is and, and how it came about? Uh, sure. So uh, uh, once a year, we put out this thing called the culture book, which actually we're happy to send out to anyone in here that wants a free copy. But I'll describe it first. Basically, it's uh, a, a physical book, and we ask all our employees to write a few paragraphs about what the Zappos culture means to them. And except for typos, it's unedited. So it includes the good and the bad, and it's organized by department, so you can see how the warehouse culture might be slightly different from the accounting culture. And so it's kind of like when you go to Amazon and there's customer reviews of products, these are essentially employee reviews of the company. And uh, yeah, so I think we've had five or six editions of it already. And to get a, your own free copy, just email CEO at Zappos.com uh, with your physical mailing address, because it's a physical book. We don't have it in PDF format or anything. Well, Adobe's a sponsor. They'd love to help you with that. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that actually goes, I mean, it was actually a conscious choice to not put it in electronic format because uh, it's one, you know, a lot of what our thinking is about in terms of delivering great services, it's not just about making customers' lives easier, but it's about making, you know, have, creating an experience that is story worthy, that, that customers remember. So your order may go smoothly with Amazon, but it's, you know, if that happens, you don't really tell your friends and family about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, same thing with the culture book. We just, we just feel like there's a much stronger emotional impact when you're actually flipping through a physical book. You, you end the book um, with sort of a call to action of sorts um, and, and say that you feel like you'll be successful with this book if, you, if others kind of take some of the lessons in it and apply it to their lives or to their business or mm -hmm. to both. Um, are you seeing examples of that? Yeah, actually, it's really cool. So we actually, and part of what led to the book w was the whole Zappos Insights thing, but I didn't mention earlier was we actually host these two-day seminars where other companies from all over the country or even world fly in, and uh, we spent two days where they, there's presentations by the heads of different departments, uh, but then we actually helped them figure out how to build their own uh, strong cultures. That's right for them. So we're not saying, oh, you should copy our culture. It's more, here's how to figure out your core values for your company and build strong cultures. And so last July, we had a company from Atlanta, the Atlanta Refrigeration Company, where they do uh, field repairs out in the field of refrigerators. So you could not think of a more opposite company in some ways than, than Zappos. And uh, after going back, they really focused on making customers happier through customer service, making employees happier through culture. And in a relatively short period of time, six months, maybe nine months, uh, they've completely transformed their company. And they showed before and after pictures. And like now employees are super happy. Their culture is strong. Uh, customers are happy. Revenues and profits are up. Uh, and there's uh, also a story of a bar in downtown Austin where they decided to focus on culture. And so the, a bar is probably the last place you would think people even think about company culture. And same and now they're one of the top performing bars in downtown Austin. So it's just really cool seeing these concepts actually, you know, really focusing on culture apply not just to Zappos and not just to the internet world, but to businesses in general. Yeah. A question over here. Hi. Um, you you spend a lot of time and obviously money focusing on individual customer experiences and with the idea that they're going to talk to their friends and their family about it. Do you find that compared to other companies, you therefore spend less resources in traditional marketing? So, our, so we do spend money on marketing. And our approach is uh, most of it is actually online direct marketing. And so, for example, buying keywords on Google. And our approach is for every, I don't know the exact numbers, but. Uh, say for every one dollar we spend on advertising, we need to get ten dollars back in revenue. And as long as you can make that ratio, uh, spend 
we'd spend a billion dollars if there was enough inventory for us to buy. And we're actually doing some offline advertising as well. Uh, some of you may have seen some of our TV campaigns. And what the reason we do that is because what we found that when you actually mix that in with our direct online marketing, it increases or improves the ROI of that online marketing so that as a package you still meet that 10 to 1 ratio or whatever. So um, yeah, we, we figure if it pays for itself, might as well spend away. So, te so you're taking the dollars that you spend in the television campaign, combining with the dollars that you spend in, in, in SE SEM, mm -hmm. and, and saying, okay, all in, we need to see. Right. So you're making those search dollars work for the brand dollars, essentially. Uh, Right, you're spending the brand dollars, but you're justifying them against the conversion. Right. On yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we just look at the overall package. Uh -huh. and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Do we have other questions? Yeah, um, Tony, it's Angela Cap from Estee Lauder Companies, and uh, you talk about service being really creating a memorable experience, but as you globalize, criteria for what constitutes great service changes. Service in Asia, there's a totally different criteria than there is in North America. So I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that, using that standard of how do I create memorable service experiences as you go into other countries where the bar is obviously much higher? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and that's probably uh, that that is one of the reasons why we're just focused on the U.S. So we actually don't ship internationally. There's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, They're based in U.S. Yeah, Do you have yeah. any plans to go international, or is that sort of like? It's, I mean, I'm sh maybe one day, but not, at least not in the next five years. We th there's just so much opportunity in the U.S. still. You know, we're just starting to make a big push into clothing, and that's four times the size of the footwear market. So if we're doing over a billion in footwear, then you know, that alone should take us to five billion. It'll, it'll keep us busy for a while. That'll keep you busy, right, absolutely. Sounds, sounds like a good kind of busy. Um, I, I have a question for you, and in, in, in sort of watching, as you have over the last 15, 20 years, companies get built by founders, and, and then founders come and founders go. I, I don't know whether this is a, an accurate observation, but it strikes me that you are Zappos in a way. You are the leader, you're the sort of inspirational figure. Um, I once asked uh, Sergey Brin this question, you know, are you ever gonna leave? And, and if so, what happens? And I think people ask that question about Apple and Steve Jobs, and they forget he was gone for 15 years, and then he came back. But, and, and things got better at Apple after he came back. Do, do, you, th do you think about that? Do you, are you concerned about the, you know, do you ever have fantasies of going and opening a lemonade stand somewhere and not having to worry about running a billion dollar company? Yeah, if it's Zappos lemonade, sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, I'm actually not the founder, I joined Exactly. Right, I'm sorry, you're the CEO yeah. so, and, and you were an original investor. Um, and, and then, th you know, I guess one, one way to think about it is our approach to, uh, to media, whether it's a print publication or TV uh, show coming, when you know, most places they would be escorted around by the PR person and the PR person would say, you can talk to this VP over there and this person in communications are there, everyone else is off limits, and you can't talk to anyone. Whereas what we do is we, when they come to our offices, we give them a tour and then tell them, lunchroom is over there, bathroom is over there, walk around, talk to whoever you want, and uh, you know, let us know whenever you're done. And some, some reporters will talk to 10 or 15 random people. And you know, they're not all gonna say the exact same words, uh, because we don't tell people this is what you say to the media. But because we know we've hired people whose personal values match the corporate core values and everyone understands the long-term vision of the company, uh, we know that there's gonna be consistency in the intent of everyone who's uh, talking to the media. And so uh, in that way, you know, we have 1,800 employees now, so those are 1,800 uh, essentially brand ambassadors, PR people, uh, you know, they're not trained in PR, uh, but you know, so I think you know I'm better known just because my title happens to be CEO. But really, uh, it's all of our employees are living the brand because we know we've hired the right people and right. from the beginning. I think it's pretty inspirational to think of a company where you can let uh, 
you know, journalists wander around unescorted. I mean, I don't know how many of you can imagine brands you work with allowing that to happen, but as a journalist, I'm usually escorted. <laughs> well, so another it's 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 very refreshing. Yeah, it's quite or, or a, it's quite a, a way concept. to experience you know the same thing online is uh, we have about 500 employees on Twitter. So if you go to twitter.sapos.com, there's a link where you can just see who those 500 are, and there's another link where it's the aggregated tweets of those 500 employees, and we most of the time they're not talking about work stuff, um, and so you can really get a feel for what the culture is. Like right. and how we interact with right. each other. Okay, we can take one more over here, and then we're unfortunately going to have to stop. Hi, Tony. Matt Friend from American Express Open. Is there ever a plan, whether in the short term or long term, to set up a physical Zappos presence so that when people experience that service, it's a faceless customer service experience right now, but bringing that um, kind of into an interpersonal perspective? Yeah, um, we've experimented with uh, having outlet stores, and we actually have one attached to our warehouse in Kentucky. Um, not everyone goes to Kentucky, um, but <laughs> really, I think one of the bigger, well, there's two challenges. One is the selection challenge. You can't really ha just, it's just, we have four and a half million pairs of shoes in our warehouse in Kentucky, which is the size of 17 football fields, so it'd be pretty hard to duplicate that selection in a physical store. Uh, and then the other challenge is any state where we open up a store, we would have to start charging sales tax for in the, um, in, on, even if they ordered on the web. And so that's basically something we've just avoided unless it happens to be in Nevada where our headquarters are or um, Kentucky. Well, please join me in thanking Tony both for the book and for coming today. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much.